pray together. Our Father, we are so thankful this morning to be gathered as your people because we know that when we gather and when we come before your word, you intend good for us. And so we trust that this holy hour will be meaningful to our, our lives and we pray that it would transform our hearts. I especially pray, O oh God, that you would use the ordinary words of a weak man to speak extraordinary words of an almighty God. So would you use your spirit to do that kind of work today in our hearts? It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Friends, how do you know that you are on the right path in this life? How do you know, for example, that this is the right college you should go to, or this is the right job you should take, that this is the right person that you should perhaps date and, and marry, that this is the right uh, calling for you, or perhaps you're considering something like adoption or foster care, or whatever the matter that you are trying to make a decision on. How do you know that you're on the right path, making the right call? Know that it will succeed, that it's what you should pursue, and that you'll actually have good in the end. How do we know these kinds of things? You know, I think ask, asking questions like that, there's a part of it that's exciting because you get to dream and imagine what the future could hold for you, but a lot of times, these kinds of questions can also be intensely disheartening because the stakes just feel so high. What if you make the wrong decision? What if your life doesn't go as planned? Because these kinds of decisions can not just determine the next few years, but perhaps in some instances, the next several decades of your life. Decisions that not just affect you, but perhaps those around you in your life and in your circle as well. And so these kinds of questions, while they can be exciting, they can also be overwhelming, debilitating, perhaps even frightening for us. So how do you pursue the right path in your life? You know, like most things in life, we tend to land somewhere on a spectrum with a question like this. And on one end of the spectrum, we would say that our future is solely determined by me, by us. And who I want you to think of, if you know Tony Robbins, think Tony Robbins saying that your destiny is all about you and you have the power to change it. Robbins has said this, for example, your destiny is ultimately determined by your decisions. You know, so on this side, we would say that we control our destiny. Our future is not something that we wait around for. No, we grab life by the horns and fulfill and achieve everything that we set out in this life to achieve. The only limitation is you and me. On the other end of the spectrum, we might believe that, no, we don't actually have that much control over our destiny. In fact, life is actually left to just chance, dumb luck, fate. I want you to think, if you know the philosopher Frederick Nietzsche, the late philosopher, or perhaps more relatable to us, another great mind, Eeyore from Winnie the Pooh, who once said, I never get my hopes up, so I never let get, down, let, get let down. And I thought the visual would be helpful for us to imagine that, right? We, we can sometimes think fatalistically about life, that whatever I hope, it's probably not going to work out anyway. What's the use of any of it? We would say on this side that there's no ultimate purpose that we're working towards. Everything's random. So the best that we can do, you and me in this life, is to hope for the best. But really, who knows how life is actually going to work out? Who knows what this decision is going to actually mean in my life? So again, we ask, how do you find and follow the right path in your life? If you grew up in church, perhaps you've heard this question asked another way. How do I know God's will for my life? How do I find it? Do we determine our future? And is God sort of just a spectator looking down from heaven without really any power to do anything or organize anything in our lives? Or do we play no part in how our lives play out and God is the one actually who moves all the pieces and we have nothing to do with how things turn out in our lives? Well, as the Bible usually does, it offers a third way for how our lives and the world itself plays out. And that is through something called providence. God's providence in the world and in your life. The working of God's sovereignty in the world and in the everyday circumstances of our lives to carry out his ultimate purposes. Providence. So that's what Genesis 24 unpacks for us today. Genesis 24 is the longest 
uh, chapter in Genesis itself. So strap yourselves in. This is going to be a long chapter, but we're not going to read all of it because there's actually a good amount of repetition in this chapter as well. Just so as we did last week, we'll spend a good amount of our time just unpacking what this chapter has to say, pointing out some nuggets along the way, and then we'll figure out how to apply this passage to our life. So here's what verse 1 of Genesis 24 says. Now Abraham was old, well advanced in years, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. God blessed Abraham in all things. That's quite a statement to save a man nearing the end of his life. Isn't that what all of us would want to hear at the end of our lives? Blessed in all things. But would you consider, is that really true? Is that really true of Abraham? Because here's a man who left his entire family in the land of Ur, all of his relatives, and was essentially a nomad for decades. He compromised his marriage multiple times, failed. He waited 25 years to have a son, and when he finally came, he almost lost him. And now, just a chapter ago, his wife has now passed away, and he's alone. Does that sound like a blessed man to you? Who of us wouldn't say of a life like Abraham, that man has had a difficult life, and yet the Bible calls him blessed in all things. Why? Well, simply, friends, because a man is blessed if he has nothing, yet has God. And so Abraham has God, and therefore he is blessed in all things. But verse 1 also calls him well advanced in years which is a.k.a. he is an old man. He is pushing 140 years old by this point, and he's nearing the end of his life, and he has a son named Isaac, who we've heard of already, and Isaac needs a wife. And so here's this dad who's trying to figure out how to get his son married, but this is no ordinary parent just trying to figure out how to get his child married because it's much more about that than actually if you know the promise that God has given to Abraham to bless him to give him descendants, as many as the stars and the sands on the seashore. And so how does that happen? Will this promise, the question that begins to come up is, will the promise be done here? Because Sarah just passed away. He only has one son through whom the promise can continue. And so in order for this promise to not fail, as it's almost done many times, Isaac needs to find a wife. And that's the only hope for this promise to continue. So we get to verse 2, and it says... And Abraham said to his servant, the oldest of his household, who had charge of all that, he had, all that he had, put your hand under my thigh, that I may make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and God of earth, that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites, among whom I dwell, but will go to my country and to my kindred and take a wife for my son Isaac. So Abraham calls on his chief servant to make an oath to him to find Isaac a wife. And he does this by having his servant place his hand under Abraham's thigh. Aren't you happy that we can just shake hands and come to an agreement and not have to do this? But this was culturally in that day very significant. Because what was happening here is that Abraham was having his servant put his hand next to one of Abraham's most intimate parts of who he was. And so, in effect, he was essentially saying, you must promise, you must swear an oath to me and to my children and to my children's children that you will keep this oath. That's how significant this was. He was, by the means of the oath, conveying how important this oath was. This is no small thing. This is the promise of God on the line. And so you've got to keep this. And so, as he makes this oath, as he puts out the conditions. He has two things that he, he tells the servant to follow. One is that this, this woman that you find must not be from Canaan, where he dwells, but from his hometown. Right? Abraham is saying she must be a person whose faith is in the God of him, of Abraham. That's one. And the second part of what he says is that Isaac cannot leave Canaan to go and find her. Isaac has to stay put. You know, this whole concept may seem foreign to me and you. Because what Abraham is trying to do in this scene is carry out what's called an arranged marriage. 
And it sounds like mission impossible. Like how, how, do you, how do you do that? Because what Abraham is asking is for this servant to travel hundreds of miles that will take several, several months to find a girl suitable from Abraham's people. Talk her into leaving her family, who she will likely never see again, and come back hundreds of miles over several months to be a wife to someone that she's never met and to just trust this servant that she's met for the first time. I mean, how is he going to do this? It might seem impossible to, to find a spouse who you've never even met before, but if you grew up in a culture like, like many of us did, and I, I did as well, you wouldn't really flinch much at this because this is very common practice in the culture I grew up in and cultures all over the world. You know, it's much more streamlined now, but that's how men, many marriages have come to be. My own wife, her parents didn't meet until the day before they got married. Think about that, a life together, and you just met each other the day before you get married. And you see that commitment back then, and in many cultures today, commitment to marriage actually comes before falling in love. Often in this kind of culture, the will to love a person came before the romance of the marriage. And that's what we see here as well. As a servant hears this charge from Abraham, he asks a reasonable question to Abraham. What if she doesn't want to come? I mean, I can't force her to come. What if she just says, no, what if I find her and she doesn't want to come? What then? And what's Abraham's response? He says, the Lord God of heaven, who took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred, and who spoke to me and swore to me, to your offspring I will give this land. He will send his angel before you, and you shall take a wife from my son from there. But if the woman is not willing to follow you, then you will be free from this oath of mine, only you must not take my son back there. Now, if you remember, the first time that you heard Abraham speak in Genesis, you know what he was doing? He was lying to Pharaoh about his wife, lying through his teeth to Pharaoh about who his wife was. He was trying to take matters into his own hands. And now this is the last time that we hear Abraham speak in the book of Genesis. And through all of his missteps and through all of his failures, see how this man has come to trust in the Lord at the end of his life. You'd imagine that for some people, wisdom comes just sort of naturally or you learn. But with Abraham, this was sort of trial by fire. He knew that trying to walk his own path was not working. And so over time, at the end of his life, he reassures this servant and tells him, listen, the Lord of heaven has made me a promise, and he is faithful. He's faithful through and through, and he showed me that over and over again. And he will take care of everything. I don't have to play God this time, because God has proven to be faithful. He will work it out. Abraham here, friends, indeed becomes the man of faith. And so the servant puts his hand under Abraham's thigh and makes the oath. And what you see in this story is several characters. Again, 67 verses. You see, you see Abraham, certainly. You see other characters that will come up. You see several characters that are noteworthy, and this servant right here is one of them. As one pastor has put it, he's a person who is never mentioned by name, and he's a minor character, but his character stands out. And you'll see how that happens over the course, course of the story. This is, this is the friend that every person needs. This is a guy who goes to bat for you. And so as we get, get into verse 10, this servant starts the journey to go and find a wife for Isaac. Verse 10. Then the servant took 10 of his master's camels and departed, taking all sorts of choice gifts from his master. And he arose and went to Mesopotamia, to the city of Nahor. And he made the camels kneel down outside the city by the well of water at the time of evening, the time when women go out to draw water. Okay. The servant loads up 10 camels. Again, culturally, very different from what we see. We might see a camel on TV or when we go to a zoo or something like that. It doesn't really mean much to us. But in that time, if you had one camel, it was a sign of great wealth that you came from affluence. And here, this servant comes in with Abraham's 10 camels. What does that mean for us? It's almost like if you were in your neighborhood and you all of a sudden saw 10 black tinted Cadillac Escalades just sort of roll, roll into the neighborhood. You know that someone wealthy, someone important is coming in. And that's, that's what happens here. The servant brings in these 10 camels, 
and his posse and whoever is with him, and they roll in, showing off the wealth of Abraham. That's what happens here. And Abraham, as you look at who he is, he was a wealthy man, a man of great affluence. As you think about that, right, what, what comes to your mind? Because, you know, as you look at the whole counsel of God, how does God speak about wealth and money? And the Bible tells us that the love of money can lead to all kinds of evil and even to the point where it leads you away from the faith altogether. And yet the Bible does not say that wealth itself is evil. In fact, he chooses to bless Abraham even here. You know, I heard this helpful thing this week, this thought that, you know, there are some who are rich who love money supremely. There are some who are rich who love God supremely. And on the other side of it, there are some who are not rich who love money supremely. And there are some who are not rich who love God supremely. And so we see that in the pages of Scripture, what God is after is, what do you love the most? Who do you love the most? What is most supreme in your life? And so in Abraham's life, a man of great wealth and affluence, he comes in squad deep with these ten camels, and he displays his wealth on purpose to show that this servant can actually back up what he's speaking about, to show him that he's legit. And where does he park his ten camels? Right outside the city by the well in the evening. Why? Because that's the time and the place where the young women of the city come out to draw water. This was like Christian Mingle 1.0, right? This is where you went to find your spouse. And he was strategic. He knew what he was doing. But the servant wasn't just strategic. It wasn't just this human engineering to, to make a situation work out. He was also prayerful. That's what it says in verse 12. That he prays, O oh Lord, God of my master Abraham, Please grant me success today and show steadfast love to my master, Abraham. Behold, I'm standing by the spring of water, and the daughters of the men of the city are coming out to draw water. That the young men, young women to whom I shall say, please let down your jar that I may drink. And those who shall say, drink, and I will water your camels. Let her be the one whom you have appointed for your servant Isaac. By this I shall know that you have shown steadfast love to my master. Can you think of that word, steadfast love? When you translate that in the Hebrew, the word hesed, it's not just, just love the way that we might understand love. It's actually a love deeply connected to the character of who God is. It's this covenant faithful love that will always be there and always be faithful no matter what. And so the servant is asking for God to be who he is, covenantly faithful to Abraham. And as he prays, he also asks, would you notice, specifically that God would show who Isaac's wife will be by what measure? Not by a thundering voice from heaven. Not by some light shining down to a point to the servant who the, the woman will be. Not by any supernatural means, actually. But by the character that this woman will display. That by her willingness to let down her jar and bless the servant... It would show him that she is generous and kind, hospitable, selfish, compassionate. In fact, in this entire scene in chapter 24, what you will not see is that nothing really happens that's supernatural that we see in other parts of the Old Testament. Instead, what we see is God working through the everyday circumstances of life. You know, God can work in two ways, the extraordinary and the ordinary, the supernatural and the natural, the spectacular and the mundane. The way that God will reveal his will to this servant is incredibly boring. It's very ordinary. It's spectacularly normal. It's just everyday life. And friends, you know, while God can fully act in whatever way he wants, in more dramatic ways as he does in the scriptures, do you and I notice the ordinary means by which he works in your life and in the world? Because everyday life, God is at work. And we probably no don't notice or see it until we look back and see the hand of God at work. Have you been in those kinds of situations? It's not until you look back to realize, oh my goodness, God was working that out and I had no idea. And here in this text, 
That's what he's doing. We'll touch more on that later. But the servant seeks supernatural guidance in the way it so often comes through the ordinary events of life. And wouldn't you know it, as the servant prays, before he even finishes praying, what happens? Verse 15, before he had even finished speaking, behold, Rebekah, who was born to Bethuel, the son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, came out with her water jar on her shoulder. The young woman was very attractive in appearance, a maiden whom no man had known. She went down to the spring and filled her jar and came up. You know, this is quite possibly the shortest wait for an answer to prayer in all of history. Because even before the prayer was finished being uttered by the servant, he opens his eyes and there's Rebecca. He lifted his eyes and there she is. Everything that she just, he just prayed for potentially right in front of him. Which, think about it, which means that Rebecca left home likely before the servant even began to pray. Unbeknownst to the servant, God effectively answers the servant's prayer before he even opens his mouth to pray it. Do you see the providence of God at work, behind the scenes, working in and through ordinary means of life to accomplish his purposes? You'll see it over and over again. Reading on in verse 17. Then the servant ran to meet her and said, Please give me a little water to drink from your jar. She said, drink, my Lord. And then she quickly let down her jar upon her hand and gave him a drink. When she had finished giving him a drink, she said, I will draw water for your camels also until they have finished drinking. So Then she quickly emptied her jar into the trough and ran again to the well to draw water, and she drew for all of his camels. Again, the culture doesn't immediately translate for us, but what's astonishing is that Rebecca not only went down into the well let her jar down, and gave the servant a drink. But after she does that, she voluntarily offers to water his 10 camels as well. I did a lot of camel research this week. You know, camels drink 25 gallons of water. And he had 10 camels. And it takes about 10 minutes for a camel to drink 25 gallons. A lot of, a lot of water. And I'm not a mathematician, but she'll likely have gone into that well to draw water because each jar that she would have carried was about three three gallons worth. That's how much it can contain. That means, if the math holds up, that she would have gone into that well over 80 times. Over 80 times carrying three gallons of water each time down into the well and back, down and back, over and over again. And the passage tells us that she did this quickly. That there was this eagerness in her heart to serve this servant. Consider that. She as well is a person of high repute. And she is serving this servant and not only him, but his camels as well. I mean, what, what character she displays here. And see what the servant does in verse 21. As this woman's doing all this work, what does he do? The man just gazed at her in silence to learn whether the Lord has prospered his journey or not. I mean, that has got to, got to be really awkward, if not really rude. You couldn't, just, you couldn't lift one finger to help her. You just gaze at her, all awkward. This woman is working her, her tail off, and he's just gazing at her, wondering if this is the woman that God has sent for Isaac. But, you know, it actually says something about Rebecca's character even more, that When this man doesn't even lift a finger to help her, she demonstrates compassion and kindness and and selflessness. You know, it says that Rebecca was a very attractive and beautiful woman, but her physical beauty is surpassed by the beauty of her character. And you see how important that is. Even as Isaac is seeking a wife, you see that these are the things that make this woman actually beautiful. And so after the camels finished drinking, it says in verse 22 that the servant took off, took a gold ring and then took some bracelets for her arms. And he asks her, please tell me who you are. Who are you? And tell me, is there room in your, in your family's home for us to stay? So who is Rebecca? Verse 24, she answers. She says to him, I'm the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Milcah, whom she bore to Nahor. She added, we do have plenty of straw and fodder and room to spend the night. Friends, this is exactly who Abraham hoped. 
God would send for Isaac. All that God promised is beginning to slowly unfold in this scene through all of these ordinary circumstances, not happenstance, not fate. And so overcome by God's providence, what can the servant do but worship? And so he does. He bows his head and he thanks God for what he's doing. And then the young woman runs home and tells her mother. And what you essentially see in this next section, verses 29 to 44, we're not going to get into all of it, is essentially the servant coming to Rebecca's home, recounting the story of what God has done, these amazing things, these ordinary things that are extraordinary since traveling from Canaan. He says, goes to their dinner table and says, let me tell you about everything that has just happened. You won't believe it. The servant, as he recounts, is honest, he's thorough, he's full of faith. And what is the response of Rebekah's family from her brother and father, Bethuel and Laban? Verse 50, then Laban and Bethuel answered and said, this thing has come from the Lord. We cannot speak to you bad or good. Behold, Rebekah is before you. Take her and go and let her be the wife of your master's son as the Lord has spoken. This family too was a family of faith. They couldn't deny that God was at work. They saw the providential and undeniable hand of God who was working through all of this. And it was settled, and the servant blesses them with even more jewelry and more costly garments. And they spend the night, they eat, they drink, they celebrate. And then the next morning, they get ready to set back to Canaan, the servant and Rebekah, the camels, all the people who are with him. But before they set off to return, suddenly the family hesitates. And it says in verse 55, Her brother and her mother said, listen, let the young woman remain with us a while, at least 10 days, and then after that she may go. The servant said to them, don't delay me since the Lord has prospered my way. Send me away that I might go to my master. They said, let's ask Rebecca what she thinks. And so everything's sort of set, and then the night goes, the next morning they feel hesitation And there's a delay in this this plan, in God's promises actually continuing. Were they realizing that perhaps they'll never see young Rebecca ever again? Were they trying to get some more goods and garments and gold and jewelry from the servant? You know, it's also important to know that in this phrase, let the girl stay for at least 10 more days. It doesn't just mean 10 days. It actually can be translated as 10 days or 10 weeks or 10 months. It was basically like saying, sure, stick around with us for another day or or two or a hundred. You didn't know how long she was going to stay. And if the servant gave in, who knows when Rebecca would return to Canaan. And so they resolved to leave it up to Rebecca. And so Rebecca comes out. They say to her in verse 58, Rebecca, will you go with this man? And what does she say? Simply, I will go. I will go. You know, in the delays that happen here, and perhaps even in the delays of your life, the things that you thought were going to work out, the plans that you set in motion, and yet there's a snag, there's a hurdle in the plan, what goes through your mind when those kinds of things happen? Do you imagine that you got it wrong? Or perhaps that God God is out of sorts, and he doesn't really know what he's doing? Well, we see here that the delay actually only helps to solidify the faith of Rebecca. Because she says, I will go. It actually shows you and me that this was Rebecca's faith, not some other circumstance that was pushing this person to fulfill the promises of God. This is an opportunity for Rebecca to demonstrate that she's willing to forsake everything and everything to follow the will of God, even if there's a delay to it. And so after a blessing from their family in verse 60, they set out for Canaan, reading from verse 61. Then Rebekah and her young women arose and rode on the camels and followed the man. Thus the servant took Rebekah and went on his way. And now Isaac had returned from Beer Lahoroi and was dwelling in the Negev. And Isaac went out to meditate in the field toward evening. Now would you consider Isaac is barely mentioned in this entire passage, but the whole thing is essentially about him. We've seen the faith of Abraham. We've seen the faith of the servant. We've seen the faith of Rebekah, but would you consider Isaac Isaac, where is he in this whole story? I mean, consider what he has been through in just a short time. In chapter 22, you saw him. He saw the knife. He saw the wood that was prepared, and he saw the fire pot. 
He put two and two together and realized this is not good, but he still went along with it, trusting God. Just last week in chapter 23, his mom passed away, throwing the entire promise of God in jeopardy. And now in chapter 24, it seems like another impossibility to find a wife from where? where from where? Who knows where this wife is going to come from? And now the, the burden, the, the weight of the promises of God actually falls squarely on Isaac's shoulders. His faith is being stretched in this. His faith is being stretched, and yet now we see Isaac meditating in the field. And what does he see? Almost like a scene from a romance novel or a Hollywood movie, it says in verse 63, And he lifted up his eyes and saw, and behold, there were camels coming. And Rebekah lifted up her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she dismounts from the camel and said to the servant, Who is that man walking in the field to meet us? The servant said, It is my master. So she took her veil and covered herself, showing that she was going to be his bride. And the servant told Isaac everything that he had done. And then Isaac brought her into the tent of Sarah, his mother, and took Rebekah. And she became his wife, and he loved her. So Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. It says he loved her. It's actually the first time this kind of marital love is even expressed in the scriptures. And it says that he was comforted by this. Why? Because his comfort, yes, was in having a wife, but it was also that God's promises are going to continue. He's going to continue to be faithful. He has shown Hesed love, steadfast, covenantal love to this family and by them the whole world. And so Rebecca meets Isaac, they wed. Rebecca becomes the new matriarch of the promise. The baton is passed, and once again, God proves faithful to continue his promise. All right, so that, that story feels so far away from anything that is relevant to us. So what, what does this mean for you and me today? How do we apply this passage to our lives? We ask again the question, how do I find God's will for my life? Well, the truth is that God's will is not lost. It's not random. It's not sort of up to fate. It might be hidden, but it's not lost at all. But as we pursue God's will, we might ourselves feel lost as if God's will is happening at a whim by chance. And so for you and me, how do we find God's will? Two application points quickly. The first is that to find God's will, you and I must rest in the uncertainty of God's providence. And I want to highlight it, the uncertainty of it, right? We'll talk through that in a moment. We know with certain areas of my life, I need to know how the pieces fall. I need to know how this thing will end. I want to make decisions based on calculations and how it will likely pan out. In essence, I want to know the future. And when I don't, I might delay or I might even despair. Do you, do you feel the same? Perhaps when things are not as clear as you would like to be, what that actually causes in your heart as you consider, what does God have? Where trusting God is more of an exercise of logic and facts about the present moment and the future rather than trust in God. You know, you and I may not even be doubting that in the end, God will actually work everything out for our good. But we might be so concerned of how painful it's going to be along the way to get there. You know, we might trust God, but how painful is it going to be to actually get to what God wants me to get to? And yet, we see that obsessing over the future, friends, is not how God wants us to live. It's not how he works, telling us the future as if we have a crystal ball. And so, like Abraham, you and I might be tempted to take shortcuts because we can't make sense of how God is going to work it out. Or we might think that God needs our help, needs a little little nudge to move things along, or that God will help those who help themselves. God's providence, Seven Mile Road, is certain in your life and in the world. It might be uncertain to you and me, but it is not uncertain to the God who rules over all things for our ultimate good. One one helpful thing to consider might be to think of a sailboat in your mind. If you've ever gone sailing or know how sailboats work, you know, you are moved along on this boat, in this vessel, and you know that relying on the sailboat is what keeps you 
afloat on the water. It's, it's staying within the actual sailboat itself. And you're moved along and moved forward by the gentle breeze of the wind. Yet in getting from one shore to the next, you have the opportunity and you have the responsibility to move the rudder along the way. And so goes the Christian life. We rest within the vessel of God to uphold us and for the breath of the Spirit to empower us to move on forward. And yet he allows us to, to determine the paths we choose as long as we stay secure within the boat. He actually allows us to move the rudder to and fro as his spirit moves us along in this life. And in some divine and mysterious way to me, not only are the waters and the boat and the shores his and upheld by his providence, but even my own hand in moving the rudder is moved by his divine hand. It's actually God's providence, not just with the scenery, but even my own life is under the providential care and plan of God. And so we move together, him guiding my every step and path like a sailboat. You know, trusting and obeying God means that you and I will say along with Rebecca, yes, I will go. I'm not sure where this is headed, but I trust in God and I will go because he's moving me along by his hand. And so is it God or us who determines our will? And friends, and somehow the mystery of God, it's sort of both. It's God working through his providence, even through us and through our decisions, to be able to unpack and un unleash his plan and providence and will in the world. Would you hear these words from the late preacher, Charles Spurgeon? He says this, You will say this morning, our minister is a fatalist. Your minister is no such thing. Some will say, ah, he believes in fate. He does not believe in fate at all. What is fate? Fate is this. Whatever is, must be. But there's a difference between that and providence. For providence says, whatever God ordains must be, but the wisdom of God never ordains anything without a purpose. Everything in this world is working for some one great end. Fate simply says that the thing must be, but providence says God moves the wheels along and there, there they are. The doctrine of providence is not what is must be, but that what is works together for our good. Friends, every single thing that happens in your life and mine is not dumb luck, fate, chance, happenstance. It's by the sheer purpose, intent, and providence of God. It, it, as you hear Spurgeon's words, it's reminiscent of Romans chapter 8, 28 that says, all things work together for the good of those who are called according to his good purpose. Follow God, brothers and sisters. Trust in God, obey God, and he will provide all that is required for you to make it from shore to shore. He will lead you along the way. He will be the provider for you. He is Jehovah Jireh, the one who provides for your every need. And so, friends, would you rest in the uncertainty of God's promises because it is actually certain to God. Second, how do we find God's will? By living diligently in pursuit of God's purposes. And there's a lot to say here, but for the sake of time, I just want to say a couple of quick things. Trusting God, following his purposes, doesn't mean idleness. It doesn't mean that we just wait around for God to do his thing. It doesn't mean that you wait for God to miraculously show you a sign, though he can certainly do that. You know, you don't have to wake up in the morning waiting for God to show you what shirt to wear that day or what route to take to work or even the bigger decisions of life. Most of life's decisions that you and I may come through the ordinary means that God gives us, but supernaturally leads us through them. And so we pray. And so we go to God's word for counsel. Uh, uh, the entire closed scripture that Rebecca and Isaac and I, Abraham did not have, God gives it to us to seek his will for us. He gives you ca godly counsel in your life brothers and sisters and pastors and friends to seek counsel as the book of Proverbs so often reminds us. Through these ordinary means, God intends for you to actually move forward in life and to not be idle. And so you know what that means, friends? 
You don't have to wait for the liver shiver in your body, the tingle in your heart and stomach that says this is the right way to go or that's the right way to go. You don't have to open up the Bible and point and say this is the plan for God, of God for me. No, he actually gives you much more for your will, for God's will in your life. God frees us in this life to make decisions and to not be idle through the resources that he gives us. There's an author, a pastor named Kevin DeYoung, and I would highly recommend you read his book. His, name, his book is aptly titled, Just Do Something. And in that book, it's incredibly helpful if you're in a season of trying to search God's will for your life. And here's one quote from that book. So the end of the matter is this. Live for God. Obey the scriptures. Think of others before yourself. Be holy. Love Jesus. And as you do these things, do whatever else you like, with whomever you like, wherever you like, and you'll be walking in the will of God. Follow God. Trust him. Love him. Think of others more than yourself. Be holy. Pursue the things of God. And the rest, God gives you, friends, the freedom to be able to live life in light of all of that. And he will direct your path. You will be in the boat. Trusting God does not mean idleness. It means that you and I get up every single day trusting that God is with you in the little and big details of life. Who you will marry, where you will move, the career you'll choose, the decisions that come up this week that you have to make. God has given you many things to determine that. And he is with you if you are in him. And that his spirit is the wind that moves your sail forward in this life. Friends, as we consider God's will for our life in this story, while this story does give us a lot of good thoughts on pursuing God's will, perhaps finding a spouse, knowing how to go about certain situations, it's, a lot, it's about a lot more than just that. This story is actually about a much greater story that God is writing in the world. It's particularly about the story of Jesus Christ and his bride, the church. Because would you consider the marriage of Isaac and Rebecca too were planned long before they knew each other or knew about this entire thing. And so God has planned a marriage with you and the church long before you and I ever knew. He was pursuing us. He predestined us before the foundations of the world were laid. He was moving things in motion, orchestrating the entire world to be able to love you and, and to pursue you. Rebecca lived in a far-off country, and she, she never met Isaac. She never knew he existed. We too, friends, lived far away from God. We were strangers to him. In fact, we were his enemies. And yet, how is it possible that we will ever come to Christ? Rebecca needed to be persuaded by God's servant that Isaac was real and true and that he can provide for all that she needed. And so must you and I be persuaded by God's servants that Jesus is true, that there is nothing better than to risk everything to follow him, to say, I will go and follow Jesus, and to know that in the end, he's working out a story for me that in the end will be for my good. Friends, along the way, you and I will fall and stumble and sin, and there's grace for that. But today, don't delay. Trust and obey in Jesus. It will not be easy, but it is sweet. It's not always clear the road ahead, but there is always a road that you may not be able to see that God has paid for you to take the next step and then the next one after that. And one day, it will lead us to the marriage supper of the Lamb, where we will be the Lord's forever never unsure about how tomorrow will turn out. Never unsure about God's will for your life because you will realize that you are perfectly within it for eternity in the embrace of God himself. And so let's entrust our entire lives, God's will for it, to him. He will certainly see us through to the other shore. Let's pray. Our Father, we pray that you would help us to live this out particularly even as your word tells us to trust in the Lord with all of our hearts, to lean not on our own understanding, in all our ways to acknowledge you and to trust that you will make straight our paths. We pray, O oh God, in the big decisions and the small ones, that you would help us to relinquish, to surrender our own 
goals and our own lives for what you want to do in our lives. And we pray, God, that you would help us to determine those things with all the good resources, with all the good things that you've given to us. Help us in this season right now, if we are in a season of uncertainty or worry or anxiety about tomorrow, to help us to know that we are within the will of God and that you will provide for us no matter what tomorrow holds. Help us to remember the covenant faithfulness of a God who is providentially working in all the world down to the very smallest details of our lives. You are with us. You will never leave us. You'll never forsake us. Help us, O God, to remember all this is true. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.